Today's webinar will be covering new tips, tips and techniques for shade measurements. I'm Peter with Solmetric. Once again, thank you for joining us. Solmetric is a company that makes test and measurement equipment for solar energy applications. Uh, we have three types of solutions, site evaluation, a PV design software, and a PV verification solution to test the IV curves uh, to verify uh, PV array performance. Overall, our mission is to provide tools which improve the effectiveness of solar systems and the people who install them by embedding know-how into those solutions. Today's topics will be first uh, uh, some of the fundamentals, site analysis considerations, you know, why shade measurements are important, what some of the terminology is, what some of the sun path definitions are, how shade can impact energy production, and what some of the strategies are for measuring shade. So I will, um, uh, that, that will be more or less uh, the fundamentals, and then we'll move into an example uh, demonstration. We'll actually have a live demo, and I will show you, uh, here's a video, which hopefully you can see of me in my office. I'll actually have a sun eye here, and you'll be able to see the screen of the sun eye, and I'll be able to make measurements with a simulated uh, tree uh, causing simulated shade. That way I can do the, the measurements indoors or the, the demonstration indoors. So we'll come back to me later. And then we'll uh, give you a, a number of other uh, places to go for additional information um, if you do want to pursue things further or share some of this material with colleagues. I will make you aware that this material will be available on our website and we will uh, uh, direct you uh, after this with an email that uh, identifies where to go to get the, the information. First, let's start with uh, motivation for measuring shade. Shade gets a lot of attention in the site uh, evaluation process for solar. And here are some of the reasons shade's so important. First of all, you want to choose the optimum location for panels or modules on a roof surface. You may have a choice. You may have some issues with shading due to uh, uh, this chimney or these trees here, for example. And you may be able to move, uh, have some flexibility in where you put modules on a, on a roof. Also, if there are going to, so you want to pick the best location. So measuring shade across the area of the roof is very important. Also, if there are any issues, you want to identify those early in the process, especially if they're showstoppers that make the deal unattractive. Uh, you don't want to chase a sale that will end up in uh, disappointment on, uh, on both sides, the contractor as well as the, uh, the client. And then there are uh, ways that you can use the shading information to predict your energy production. And having an accurate uh, reflection or prediction of what energy production will be allows installers to gain credibility and to uh, build follow-on business by establishing that credibility in the marketplace. Also, there's a financial benefit to measuring shade, uh, not only in optimizing the state rebates, uh, since many states have the rebates that are uh, shade adjusted, but if there's a feed-in tariff or other ongoing credit, that those are also a function of production, and so production is uh, obviously influenced by shade. In fact, with the, the case of uh, PV or, or, or photovoltaic systems, shading can have a disproportionate impact on energy production, and I want to talk about that a little bit now. But even in the case of, of uh, solar thermal systems, shading can have a significant impact on uh, the amount of, of uh, hot water that is created and therefore uh, have an impact on the financial return of the system. First let's start with a little bit of basics about the, uh, the sun paths and, and uh, what can happen to the, to the sun. Obviously the sun goes through an arc on any given day uh, from having no access in the early hours to uh, having some access and then a, a maximum at the the solar noon part of the day, uh, due to shading, there might be reduced access or due to clouds, insulation. Um, the array orientation is also very important, depending on how it interacts with the solar elevation and, and uh, azimuth. And then there's shading and, and soiling that can cause issues on that, the modules as well. 
all these are things to take into account. Uh, because the Earth's uh, rotation or, or tilted axis uh, relative to the to its uh, axis of of orbit, there is a uh, a change in the way those sun paths uh, are over the course of a year. So in the summer, it it's uh, might do uh, this. If you look from sunrise to sunset in the winter, it might look more like this. This is a 2D view. We'll uh, talk about different views in a minute. But in general, the sun uh, travels uh, a lower elevation, uh, goes to a lower elevation at solar noon in the winter than in the summer, and traverses less of a path across the sky, so covers more less of an azimuth range in the winter as it does in the summer. Here's a more uh, technical graphic of that. These are put out by the University of Oregon. This is for Portland, Oregon. And you can see this is the December 21st or winter solstice uh, sun path going across. Uh, and this x-axis here is solar azimuth, which is direction with 180 degrees being exactly south, zero degrees being north. So 90 degrees is east, 270 is west. And so the sun makes a path in general from east to west across the sky. East is the morning, uh, so, so west is the afternoon. If you're standing on a roof, and this is what I, uh, I think is the important for, for solar installers to get a good feel for, is if you're on a rooftop looking south and you look off to your left, that's where the sun will come from in the morning. You look off to your right, that's where the sun will go in the afternoon. And then you want to try to figure out uh, what is going to uh, stand in your way in the, in the meantime. Notice here that there's a significant difference in the azimuth range uh, between the June 20, December 21st and the June 21st. This is the June 21st at, uh, sun path. And you can see a significant, uh, significantly more azimuth range going all the way from below 60 degrees to above 300 degrees. So it's actually, the sun is actually wrapping around to the north, uh, which sometimes surprises people. Uh, but it does wrap around a little bit uh, towards the north in much of the, the US. And you can see the places in between. In fact, the equinox here, March and September uh, 22nd, is, uh, is the one day of the year where uh, throughout the, uh, the whole planet, the uh, sun does rise exactly in the east and set exactly in the west. Other than that, it's an approximation. So then uh, the next thing is what happens when you get uh, shading obstructions that would influence this sun path, uh, for example, trees uh, or buildings, mountains, whatever. You can see that they're going to cause some reduction in the amount of energy. Uh, you can see one thing I didn't mention is these lines here are the hours of the day, with this one in the middle being solar noon. Those are, are solar times, uh, and they're um, related, but not exact, not the same as uh, as the standard time, which will describe a different shape, which we'll talk about later. But um, each one of these hours and each one of these month uh, windows here would allow a certain amount of insulation to uh, or radiation to hit the uh, a surface. If you shade that that segment you're going to lose that amount of energy. For example, if this 1.3 were shaded by this tree, uh, then you would lose that, that portion of the overall amount during the course of the year. So you can see that you, know, you can add up all the chunks and add up all the ones that you're going to lose, and you can make a, a sort of a ratio of how much the shading is going to impact you. We'll come back to that in a minute. Now, if we take a little detour and talk about what's happening electrically. There's a thing called an IV curve, uh, which describes the performance of a solar electric system. So I'm just talking about the electric portion at the moment. So on, on the DC side, you have uh, any module or any string or any array is going to have a DC characteristic that has current that's basically flat as a function of, of voltage up to a certain point where it rolls off. And so the, the system operates at this so-called max power point. So this, is, this blue curve here is the power versus voltage. And you can see that uh, in the, the unshaded case, uh, you have a nice, uh, healthy looking curve here. And this uh, a max power point is determined by the max power voltage and max power current. And that's your max power, which is your pro the product or, the, or current times voltage. 
So that's uh, the healthy situation. And what what happens when you uh, temperature increases? You get some change in where this uh, uh, this hill happens, and when irradiance increases, you get a change in where this plateau is in the IV curve. When you get shading happening, that can cause bumps and wiggles in this, which can put dings in where your max power is and take away uh, energy from your system. This is an example of uh, hard shading a business card on a single cell within a string of 1580 watt modules. And you can see the ding here. That nice healthy power curve would look more like this. And you can see the ding is causing you know, a drop uh, probably in the neighborhood of uh, hundreds of watts. Uh, just due to a business card in the, on, a, on one cell and one s module of one str string. And uh, so it can have a, a dramatic impact. Here's a more significant partial shading. You can see that uh, you know if you lose a significant number of uh, cells, you lose a cell string, for example, or a couple of modules, you can get these big dings. And that's where you get a significant deviation from where the IV curve should be, which is these dots here to where it actually is. And the power curve is reduced from where it could be to where it actually uh, ends up there. So that's a, a, some examples of, of the impacts of shading. So that's some of the, the why shading is so important. Here are some tools that have uh, been used to measure shade. There's a, a globe which can provide reflections of the shade. Uh, which you, then you can capture those reflections using uh, either a camera or some sort of uh, a pen here. There's been various camera configurations to actually put together a, a, a panorama. And then there's the Solmetric Sun Eye, which is uh, the thing we're going to talk about today, which is a fisheye lens and takes a picture of the whole entire sky in one, uh, one go. So here's a, a little bit of a view. Imagine you're on the roof lying down where the modules are going to be looking up with a fisheye picture. And what you'd see is uh, 360 degrees around you. You'd see in your peripheral view, you'd see any shading obstructions. And then if you could imagine that you could see when the sun paths were going to, how the sun paths were going to go on there, this would be the June one, which would be up towards the zenith or the highest point in the sky, straight up. Straight up is the middle or 90 degrees azimuth. So that would be the highest point, June 21st. This would be the lowest point, December 21st. And you could differentiate between the shade obstructions and paint them green and the, the open sky and paint it yellow. Then you could do a bunch of, uh, put the times in, do a bunch of analysis, do a bunch of math, and you could calculate those percentages that we talked about as solar access um, or, or uh, shading obstruction elevation angles or, or whatever. Uh, that's what the sun eye does. And uh, as an example here, 63% Solar access means that 37% of the energy uh, available is being lost due to shading in this example. We'll get back to that more in a few minutes. So to, to make a shade measurement strategy, there are a number of things that you uh, will require. One is to uh, uh, probably take multiple readings. The, when you use this hemisphere method or, or these methods that I talked about, you're basically going to a point in space or a point on the array, maybe uh, above the roof where the, the modules are going to be, and you're going to make a point reading. And you're going to want to take multiple measurements across the area of the array to uh, do your best to, to find out what's going to happen across the, the whole area of the array. You want to measure, so you're going to take multiple point readings, and you might have a maximum of five meters or some some agreed to value which might be a function of your company or your state rebate or, or something. Uh, a common number might be 5 meters or 15 feet in between readings as a maximum. Some people make it 20 feet. Some state programs like California has a 40 feet uh, where you have to have at least uh, readings at least every 40 feet across the, uh, the area of the roof. And then uh, you want to measure at the height of the modules. Uh, so that might be three inches, six inches off of the uh, the roof surface. Um, so you're frequently measuring down at your shoe tops, which makes the uh, the fisheye lens approach uh, a convenient way to do it. You also want to measure at the array corners to make sure you're looking for worst case. Look at the make measurements at the points on the array which are closest to the obstructions. 
take average or worst case readings to, to take the multiple readings and compute their effect across the roof, uh, across the array area. Uh, you can average or worst case the solar access readings or the uh, obstruction elevation readings. And then you can uh, also uh, sort of separately or along with that process, uh, you can map out shade-free zones. And uh, the SunEye can be used for that. And I'll show you uh, some features that facilitate that. Also note here, you want to meet the requirements of your state rebate program and your rebate calculators. And it's very important in this process to uh, you know, make a plan, have a plan when you go on the roof. Don't just uh, you know, take a fancy tool up there, but have a plan and come down with the results you're going to need to take the next step in your process. Here's uh, some examples of, uh, of multiple readings. Uh, captured with GPS on, in, uh, in the uh, SunEye. And then uh, you can actually look at those in a, a Google Earth plot. And you can see you know, over the, the different areas, you can see the impacts of, of different uh, obstructions like the trees uh, for this skyline, Sky 01. Skyline is what we call these hemisphere pictures. So these are some of the important terms that we talk about during the uh, shade measurements. Uh, irradiance, insulation, solar access, tilt orientation factor, total solar resource fraction, and obstruction elevation. I'm going to go through them briefly. Um, irradiance is really the power per unit area that comes from, from the sun. Typical number is on a sunny day, 1,000 watts per meter squared or 1 kilowatt per meter squared. That's an instantaneous reading, so there are little gadgets that you can point uh, you know, in, the, in the plane of the array and you can get a, a basic reading of that. It comes out in kilowatts per meter squared. That's an instantaneous reading. So if you have a radiance through time, you get insulation, which is uh, uh, the amount of uh, solar energy, or kilowatt hours, per meter squared. So if, for example, if you have a kilowatt per meter squared in that, on that summer day for six hours, which might be uh, you know, a sunny location. You might have six sun hours effectively during the course of a day. You might get six kilowatt hours per meter squared of insulation. If you have a couple of uh, square meters, uh, then you'd get, uh, if you had two square meters, you'd get 12 kilowatt hours uh, received at the surface. Now, how much of that you can turn into useful AC kilowatt hours? It might be 10% or 15% uh, uh, of that number but that's uh, going to depend on your, your system design. This is the resource that's available to you in the unshaded case. Now, the amount of insulation will also be a function of the azimuth and tilt of your roof surface. So this is a plot that shows the uh, tilt of the roof, the azimuth of the roof, and the insulation or, or uh, incident solar radiation that happens for each, each of those values. So for example, the peak here, the 100% value, which is this number of kilowatt hours per meter squared, is actually at 90, 191 degrees azimuth and a tilt of 32 degrees. Now, you may be familiar with the approximation that the optimum solar access is, or optimum tilt and azimuth is at uh, latitude tilt and directly south due south or 180 degrees. And that's an approximation. The actual value is influenced by weather patterns. So in this case, for San Diego, there's a little, probably a little bit more fog in the morning, which shifts out the optimum to be a little bit more tilted toward the west or into the afternoon sun. And uh, the, um, so daily patterns will shift it one way or the other there. We do have on our website a tool which is uh, under the support tab, uh, which is called an the annual insulation. And with this tool, you can select your location. And I'll, I'll pick one just that I know is unique. I'll pick the Honolulu International Airport in Hawaii. And um, you'll see that it's shifted significantly toward the morning or toward the east. Most are closer to the to the south and latitude, but you can put in you know your uh, uh, location near you and see how azimuth and tilt of a fixed roof surface will influence the amount of insulation available. 
Now, while I'm on this, I want to say that the the uh, the surrounding values are called. Uh, oh, sorry. These these values here in uh, this value uh, at the 99% circle here is the amount of insulation. Uh, the deviation you get in tilt and azimuth for 99% of that available uh, total insulation or maximum ideal insulation. This circle is 95%, so th and this one is 90%. So you can sort of see how it rolls off as a function of azimuth and a function of tilt, uh, what you get in terms of uh, kilowatt hours per meter squared. So as you move away from the optimum, you get less than 100%, and that that percentage is called uh, total uh, tilt orientation factor, and that percentage is an important one for determining whether your uh, roof surface is uh, uh, ideal or not, or, or a good one for uh, for your application. Of course, the other thing is going to be shade and how shade is going to impact you, but we'll get to that in a minute. Here's another tool we have, which is called the roof azimuth tool. Roof azimuth, once you have a tilt in a roof, the tilt goes toward a certain direction. So in this case, the, this is the downhill part of this roof surface. This is the peak here, and downhill goes this way on, and on the other side. And this is an overhead map, a Google map. And what we have is a little tool where you can draw a line and determine from the aerial image what the uh, roof azimuth is. And that's typically something you need to know to be able to do your energy calculations and uh, for many of your state rebates. It's also a little bit easier to do this online and ahead of time uh, from an aerial photo uh, than it is to do with a compass on site. Uh, a compass on site will, will be, um, you know, another way to do it, but it's good to, to just double check it before you go out. So tilt orientation factor is uh, is this thing that we've talked about. Now, solar access is the other thing, which is this insulation ratio, which just takes into account the shading, how much does shading take out of your insulation. And so that's a significant uh, factor, too. But the two factors are independent, solar access and tilt orientation factor. And if you want to combine them, there's something called total solar resource fraction, which is the uh, solar access times the tilt orientation factor. If you have 90% solar access and uh, tilt orientation factor of 90%, the net total solar resource fraction would be 81%. So to compare two different roof surfaces, you really want to look at the total solar resource fraction, which will combine the effects of whether you're optimized uh, in terms of your azimuth and tilt, as well as the uh, shading impacts that are, you, you see with it, that field of view of that panel. Here's a, a chart that shows this sort of graphically. If you had an optimum amount, you'd lose some because you're not optimum. That'd be your tilt orientation factor. You'd lose some because of shading in the field of view of the, the modules. That would be lost due to shading. So the net result is your total solar resource fraction. So here's another example where you have very poor total tilt orientation factor. Maybe you're putting your modules on the north side of the roof here, uh, but you might have very good solar access. There's not much shade around, but it's still not a very good roof surface. So uh, you have to look beyond just the solar access and uh, to know how to compare. Uh, for example, if you're looking at a house on a west roof and a south roof, which one is better? You're going to want to me measure shade on both, but you're also going to want to consider how the, the sub-optimization of the west roof will impact. So the south roof may see a little bit more shade, but may be a better choice for energy production. So here's some examples of, uh, of measurements with the sun eye. We're going to do these in a minute, but uh, this is uh, the fish eye picture where you get the solar access reading. You can also look at total solar resource fraction and tilt orientation factor. Over here we have the uh, monthly view of the uh, of the solar access information. This one combines multiple skylines. This is just a single skyline. And we'll get into those more in a, in a few minutes. So those are solar access, solar resource, insulation ratios. Now another way to look at the data is just fundamentally as obstruction geometry. So if you look at the angle 
or the distance away and the height of an obstruction above the array, that creates an angle. So the obstruction elevation angle is measured by the sun eye, and that you want to have a small angle, a low angle. So you want a, either a very small height or a very large distance. And uh, so typical rules of thumb to put your, your, uh, your array into is where you have a distance to height ratio maybe greater than two. That's California's minimal shading. Uh, that uh, corresponds to 26 degrees of, of uh, obstruction elevation. Or a distance to height ratio greater than three, if you're talking about sort of in the middle of a time zone, in the middle of the US, that's uh, shade free from nine to three. You have to actually go through the analysis to make sure that's actually true, but it's a, it's a rule of thumb that a, a, height, a distance to height ratio greater than three will um, have a good shot at making shade free from nine to three, which is your, you know, your, your uh, bulk of uh, production time. So you can see the distance to height ratios drawn here for, uh, you know, a dormer, for a vent pipe, and for uh, a tree. Now the tree here with the larger uh, distance and larger height might have more impact across more modules. This, this uh, vent pipe might only affect one module, uh, but uh, you have to uh, sort of calculate that out. So the SunEye does also uh, measure and display the obstruction elevation angle. This is like a different way of looking at the same data. And uh, so this is as a function of azimuth here. You can see the sun pass like we showed in that Portland chart earlier. And uh, you can see the obstruction elevation angle as a function of azimuth and you know, how the obstructions will you know, take away some of the energy from uh, and, and what time of day and what time of year that will happen. Notice here that the, uh, the lines of time are actual standard time, and they have this, uh, this factor which is uh, different from solar noon. Uh, that's because as you're, uh, you're, you're someplace within a time zone, and over the course of, of the year, you sort of walk through that time zone, and it changes. Uh, you don't get the, the maximum height of the sun every day exactly at the same uh, clock time. Uh, that's the difference with, uh, from solar noon. You can also do analysis on this where you can make tables of the data for uh, specific points. And that's actually something that many of the state rebate programs require. I'll talk about that in a minute. So that's uh, the SunEye and a basic introduction to the, uh, to the product. I'm going to uh, just point out that the, when you operate the SunEye, the most important thing is to point it south, hold it level, and push the button, and then you'll, you'll be able to view the results in various ways. So these are the, the SunEyes that are available. This one was introduced in 2006 and is now being phased out. Uh, was a very popular product that was called the 100 series. This is the model 210, which is the new one with the uh, integrated uh, level compass and GPS. So we will uh, now proceed with our demonstration. And before I do that, though, or as I get that set up, I'm going to look over at the questions and see if there's a few questions I can address. If you have a question, go ahead and enter it into the uh, question area. I don't see any at the moment. All right, no questions, so I'm going to continue on. So what I have here now is uh, I'll back up a little bit and show you the, uh, the webcam. There's me in my office again. And I'm going to uh, be doing a demonstration showing you how to make the measurements using the SunEye. And then I'll also uh, show you what I'm doing with the SunEye as you see the pictures. So this picture here 
is uh, excuse me. This one here is the Sun Eyes Display, and that actually is uh, this is a program called Pocket Controller Pro I use, so I can project the display of the Sun Eye onto the computer screen, so you can see it. Uh, so it's just within this uh, white part here, and this the uh, Sun Eye Display can actually be controlled with a stylus or with your finger, and you can push the buttons and access the menus. Uh, the menus are really just uh, very simple. There's a one, two, three um, menu progression here, session, skyline, and view. Session is when you set up to make a specific site visit uh, or a specific project, one, two, three Main Street or whatever. And then skylines are the actual sky pictures, and then view is how you look at the data. So we'll be uh, going through that, and um, there's also a tools menu to access uh, other functions. First, we'll begin with the session menu. So I'm going to press session, and then a new here. I'll do it with the mouse, because then you can see what uh, exactly which buttons I'm pressing. And I'll press a new session. And we'll go ahead and give the session a name. And when you press the labeling area there, you get the uh, soft keypad, which is like on your cell phone here. And I'll put in uh, a name, uh, demo. Oh. I guess it I already had one in there named demo. So I'll call it demo, demo one. And then I can also enter a session note. I can actually label all the skylines. Now, to get the sun path calculations, I need to enter in the, I need to specify my location. I can manually enter the latitude and longitude, or I can use the GPS if I have that option built in, or I can pick a nearby city for the region that I'm currently in. So I'll go ahead and pick a nearby city. And uh, I'm in California, and I'm in, uh, Sebastopol, California, and when I enter in the city, it will know the latitude and longitude from the database built inside the instrument, and I will be able to uh, also see the magnetic declination there. That's the difference between a compass reading and the actual true reading of, uh, of the uh, compass or the true direction uh, that is associated with that location. Uh, magnetic declination varies as a function of location and through time. So this is a, uh, a good thing so that the instrument takes care of it so, so you don't have to worry about it. So now we've set up a session, and we can, uh, uh, that's for one uh, site visit. Now we're ready to take skylines. And to do a skyline, I can do skyline new. Or another alternative is I can press this little star button you can see some buttons here on the front panel. There's one here with a star on it. I can actually press that button. It'll come up to the, to the new uh, Skyline menu as well. During the first Skyline of each session, it'll ask what you want to use as your default azimuth and tilt. And let's say that we're going to use 150 degrees of azimuth and uh, 20 degrees of tilt. And that will be how the calculations for solar access are computed based on the uh, azimuth and tilt we assume for the, the panels. Or usually that's the same as your roof surface. So now the camera will be activated. And that's the fisheye camera. Now I'll be showing you uh, two cameras. So hopefully you, we have sufficient bandwidth here to, uh, to project both of them. And the, uh, there's the, the fisheye camera. And you can see, as I put the sun eye in uh, to the sort of mock tree area here, you can see I'm pointing generally south. 
You can see the compass and level indication over here. Uh, this is uh, pointing uh, south-ish. When I'm exactly 180, that would be south. And then I'm holding it level. Now, as I move the sun eye oh, uh, to various points along the roof, you can see different impacts from that from that uh, that tree. So let's say I'm uh, on the uh, along the gutter line now, and I move from one edge of the roof toward the tree, where I'd have significant shading even in the middle of the day, and I move away from that shading toward the uh, west side of the roof, and so the tree moves more toward the east, and you can see now it's just causing uh, some morning shade. And uh, so that's better. Now as I go up, maybe I have a tilted roof, so I'm going up away from the, uh, the, the tree, now still on the west side, and I hardly get any impact from the tree at all. And then I go over to the, to the other side there, and then I may uh, see the tree a little bit, but I'm up above the tree now. So up on the higher part of the roof, it looks like I'm all right. As I come down again toward the, the uh, tree, you'll see that it comes back into play there. So you can see I can use this as a preview uh, during uh, the measurements. Let's go to a point on the, the low middle side of the roof and snap a picture. When I snap the picture, you notice the sun paths uh, adjust based on how I'm holding the instrument. But when I want to snap the picture, I need to make sure I'm holding it uh, generally south and level so that those things light up. You can see if I'm away from south and away from level, uh, it goes dark there. When I go back to south within that window, then I can uh, go ahead and take the picture. I can take the picture by pressing the center snap the snap button on the display, or I can press the button on the sun eye itself, the center button in the navigation window, and um, or, sorry, the hard key on the uh, on the display there. So now you can see it's showing me the skyline, and it's going to process the skyline, and you can see that I have. Uh, it's going to automatically look for what, what is open sky and what is obstruction and paint them yellow and green respectively. And so what you'll see here is uh, we'll have a significant amount of morning shade and a lot of uh, good clear sky in the middle of the day and the afternoon. So that is a, a, a automatic process where it automatically detects those things. The process is not perfect in some cases. You might see green where you expected yellow, and you can use this paint brushes to, uh, to edit that out. Another function here is the, uh, that the, uh, the solar access is displayed. 91% means that 10% of the energy is being lost due to the shading. And uh, I can look at that in um, uh, the summer months or the winter months. And I can also see that the, uh, I can view the data in different ways. This is my third menu now that I can look at the solar access uh, by month. And you can see that uh, all months are uh, affected a little bit. And you can also see the view by uh, obstruction elevation angle. And that's the, the tree there. and, and uh, basically no obstructions uh, other than that. So that is uh, an overview. I'm going to jump into a few of the, the more detailed features. With the annual sun path view, you can see that I can uh, view not only the, uh, the solar access, but I can also experiment. Let's try to see what happens if I trim this tree and what, what would uh, the effect be on uh, on solar access. So I'll go to add some yellow here and uh, take out some of the tree and see what the impact would be. I can apply those changes and save the original scenario or just apply them uh, to the uh, create a new scenario 
in addition to the old one or right over the old one. Now you can see that the solar access has improved to 95%, and I've got a lot of my summer production back, so I'm guessing that uh, when we go to the monthly, we'll see a significant increase in the summer months there. And uh, because the sun is basically going over that tree in the, in the summer months, so you can see that here. Another thing you can do there is uh, you can look from the annual sun path view, you can go to this solar access and select solar resource to look at TOF and TSRF. And you can see those numbers here. And then we can also go to a, what's called windowed access. And that's where we can look within a certain window of time time of day and month of the year. So if I select, for example, all year, I want to be um, look at my shade within the 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. window. And I can press OK and close there, and it will show me what's my solar access within that window. And you can see it's 100%. I have no shade within that window. But I might want to go back and look on the, uh, on the preview mode so I'm going to press this Start key and go back to the preview mode. And what I'll do is I'll actually see that same window appear in my preview mode. So while I'm up on the roof, again, back in that preview mode, I can see where on the roof will be shade-free during that window of time. So I can maybe walk off to where it's just the tree just leaves my uh, window, I can mark that with a chalk line, and then, uh, and then you know, move, move to an, uh, another location where I might have other obstructions and mark them similarly. So I can map out a shade-free zone. Um, you know, a lot of people uh, underestimate the complexity of calculating these uh, impacts of shading with 3D structures and so on. It takes a lot of measurement, a lot of time, and this is a, a more simple way to do it by just walking around with that window uh, predefined. So that's how you take data on the sun eye and how you uh, take the, the readings. Typically on a roof surface, I might take uh, anywhere from 8 to 10 readings uh, on a typical residential roof for a, a big um, job in a uh, uh, commercial application, I might take, uh, you know, dozens or even hundreds of readings. Uh, eventually, you'll get to the point where you need to download the data back into your SunEye and then you'll or back into the computer, and then you can process the information from there. So I'm going to stop there uh, while I transition to the next phase, which is a little bit of the software demo, and I will uh, just check if there are any questions. If you have a question, feel free to type it in. I don't see any questions, so I'm going to keep going. And uh, so once you're through with your, uh, your readings on the SunEye, you can then go to the SunEye software here, which is uh, shown here. I'm going to go to the Session Properties menu. This is the uh, desktop software that comes with the SunEye. And it'll basically allow you to transfer your data from the device into your computer. And once you do that, then you'll be able to view the session. You can look at the session properties. You can view all the skylines. This is me on my house. You can view uh, you know, the skylines. Um, by the way, notice one thing that, that I'll point out here is that uh, while the operator may be in the picture and Nobody looks good in a fisheye lens, by the way, but the operator may be in the picture. Normally, the operator will be to the north of the sun path, which are down to the south. If you lean over too far or you're to the side too much, you might end up in the sun paths and distort the, the shade reading. But if you're outside the sun paths, you will not distort the shade reading. So that's uh, now I can, uh, in, this, uh, in the computer, I can also use the edit mode 
with the full computing power and uh, large display of the, the uh, of the computer and I can uh, also uh, view the data in in the same same ways this is windowed so it's uh, uh, that's why it, it looks so dramatic there uh, I can go back to viewing the solar access and then view monthly solar access and view the obstruction elevation angle. And then you can output reports and I'll just uh, browse an existing report and just uh, show what those look like. I, I can export a report. I can put a logo on it. I can uh, get a summary of the, the whole session. The average of all the sky, solar access averages of all six skylines in this session. I can get different files output to, to CSV files, which I can open in Excel. And uh, for the session, uh, obstruction elevations, et cetera. And I can look at each of the skylines uh, pictures in, in uh, both the fisheye view as well as the monthly access view. And I have data that I can uh, export to a variety of applications as well. So that is a summary of the SunEye desktop software. And I think that will uh, take us back into the PowerPoint. And I'll, I'll uh, just jump ahead a little bit. There's a, uh, something else that the SunEye can do that I didn't show earlier, which is it can measure the azimuth and tilt of the roof. Azimuth you need to to uh, to point. So I'll go into the I'll go into the to the uh, orientation menu, which I can get to by pressing this button here on the on the keypad, and that shows me the uh, GPS readings if I have them. It shows me my uh, compass reading if I'm holding it uh, level. So uh, you can see as I turn the device, it's showing me the compass reading. And I'm also showing the tilt there. So I can point you know, in perpendicular to the gutter line, say, and I can read the azimuth of the roof. And then I, if I want to read the tilt of the roof, I can um, hold it at the uphill or downhill, and I can read the tilt of the roof, similar to what the uh, gentleman is doing here on this roof surface. We talked about the site survey mode, and that's where, as you walk around the roof, you'll see the sun paths adapt to wherever you are. We talked about how the windowed access can give you a good sense of uh, where the, the shade-free zones can be. And you can see how obstructions and, and sun paths are going to overlap. And so that's a, a useful mode there. Uh, so the windowed access mode, we already demonstrated. Uh, important part, again, is you can look at that in the post-processed sun path, uh, annual sun path view, or you can look at it in uh, the preview mode so you can see, uh, map out that shade-free uh, direction. The uh, Another thing is that in some sky situations, the sun eye will be fooled by what's clouds or, or uh, what's sky and what's obstruction. And there are a couple of settings here that are actually in, uh, in the preview menu. And the setting is, is for sky type. And I'll just cover that briefly. If you get errors, uh, such, such as this error occurs when some, in some cases you can have a very bright sky and it gets detected with a lot of of uh, uh, obstruction, which is a false uh, reading. And so if you change the sky type setting from normal to clouds and blue sky, it will adjust the camera settings and fix that problem. Similarly, there are some cases where you have obstruction that can be falsely detected as open sky, where there's a lot of transitions here. And if you adjust to the shaded setting, 
you get a much better reading. So that's something to be aware of. Uh, the computer algorithm used to detect the sky uh, needs a little help in some uh, shading situations. Uh, alignment issues. Um, there, if you're not properly aligned, the uh, SunEye will give you a warning if you're not within its, its window. Actually, the SunEye now, uh, we added a new feature recently where the SunEye will automatically, let me go back to uh, setting the, uh, pressing the button here for the preview, and it'll go back to the, to the picture mode. And you'll see the, the compass and, uh, and level. And as I set those, you can see as, as I put them uh, within that window of level and, and uh, direction, that as long as it's yellow, it will take the readings at that point, and it will automatically uh, correct those readings to be exactly as if they were level and south. So uh, we've made some improvements there. And it's uh, uh, significant. Um, it makes it significantly easier to use. Now there are some situations where you'll be, uh, unfortunately, possibly impacted by a metal roof, which can impact the compass. The compass is uh, uh, using the magnetic field of the Earth to orient the sun eye, and if there is metal nearby, that can sometimes distort those magnetic fields, and therefore you have uh, a, a problem. And so we have this align to target mode. And what I'll do is I'll uh, just show you briefly how, how that would be used. And so to get to that menu, I actually will go to this, this key up here. This is, uh, key right here brings up a menu, which has that sky type that I mentioned, but also has this uh, align with compass is the normal mode, and the alternative mode is align with target. And when you go into that mode, you can then set a target, which is different from your compass reading. So for example, if you wanted to set the target in line with that roof that we were doing earlier, which was 150 degrees, because you have seams on the roof or something that you can line up to. Sorry. Set, set target. I pressed the wrong button there. And then you can uh, either line it up with the compass and then capture that reading, or you can enter it manually as 150 degrees. and then set target. And when you're in that mode, the top of the instrument will point towards 150 degrees. So you can see now that it's at 150 degrees rather than 180, which is where the sun path sort of point uh, would be out here. And 150 degrees azimuth is where I'm going to point. So I line up my device with that and uh, take the, the snap according to that, and the sun eye will automatically correct the readings for that. So that's uh, aligned to compass mode. And basically, the compass is ignored during that measurement. And the measurement is referenced to the, to the target that you entered, not to the 180 degrees uh, necessarily. You can also do it at 180 degrees if that's more convenient. So line up, it allows you to line up with the seam of a roof or a gutter or some sort of uh, faraway object that you know the azimuth of. Another thing we've done recently is called the SunEye Extension Kit. And that is a way to uh, put the SunEye on the end of a, of a pole. And what this gentleman's doing here is he's got the uh, holding the extension kit. And the SunEye is lifted up to the edge of the roof, uh, for example, near the gutter. And you can see it's, you know, maybe it's or getting oriented close to south, but it doesn't have to be exactly south because it'll correct. And we wanted to do this so that you could have a single operator uh, operate the system. So the measurement is triggered by rotating the sun eye, uh, rotating the pole, which rotates the sun eye. That rotation is sensed to snap the, the, the photo 
and then uh, the automatic automatically the azimuth and level are corrected for whatever the the readings were there uh, when that was taken. Uh, you can make multiple readings without accessing the sun eye. So you go into a special mode called extension kit mode, which I can actually uh, just show you where that is. On the same menu that we used a moment ago, you can um, to to get to a line to target. You can uh, we'll go back to align with compass, and we'll use extension kit mode, and that will. Uh, when we go into this mode, that we'll have the sun eye up on top of the pole, and this is actually this is actually an example of the pole here. I can't demonstrate it uh, completely right now, but it has extending uh, neurals here, which allow you to to lift it up with multiple telescoping sections that go up to 18 feet up, and it allows you to to make the measurement up. Uh, once you go into that mode, the sun eye will actually bark the commands at you and, rotate to snap. and tell you, in that case it said rotate to snap, it'll wait for rotation of the instrument. Once the rotation of the instrument happens, it'll trigger and tell you what to do for the next step. So that's uh, the sun eye extension kit. And uh, just a couple of wrap-up uh, features. The GPS is an option that's built into the SunEye, and that allows you to uh, detect the location, latitude, and longitude for the session, but also to geotag each skyline as you're collecting them, and then show that in a file on Google Earth. I showed you one example before. Here's another example. Uh, if you can imagine uh, using the SunEye extension kit, walking around a parking lot, uh, and having the GPS on, you could, uh, you know, evaluate shade for an, uh, you know, a canopy or, or solar parking structure, uh, you know, 10 or 12 feet off the ground uh, fairly easily. You could come back in uh, to the office, uh, look at each of the readings in a Google Earth map, so you could put them in context with uh, the customer's environment, and you could have a nice conversation with the client about why you want to put the system on this side of the, the uh, parking lot rather than this side because of the trees or whatever the, the issue is, you can have the uh, a good conversation, uh, some good analysis uh, using those tools. Generally, the, the uh, SunEye stores more than 100 readings. It depends on the resolution, but 100 skylines in memory. Then you transfer those to the, to the computer. You can generate reports as we've showed, and you can uh, also email and, and print those reports, uh, put them into MS Word. We have files available for a number of other tools as well. And to get new software updates, which we do come out with periodically, you can download software from our website and you get uh, uh, a process that leads you to an update both in the device as well as in the, uh, in the PC software. Our online resources are, we have the user's guides available online. We have a knowledge base that's searchable, so you can type in, for example, uh, GPS. I'll just uh, show that real quickly here on our, on our website under support, knowledge base. You can type in, if you had a problem with GPS, you can type in GPS and browse through uh, common questions and how those are, uh, you know, the answers are provided there. Uh, we also have a technical support line, which is open in California business hours, and then uh, we uh, are try to stay responsive to our emails. Uh, we've got some articles that are referenced and some app notes are referenced on our website in the, uh, the support section, as well as uh, some Twitter and other uh, activities that we do. So some of key benefits. Uh, we, we get uh, uh, excellent accuracy and repeatability uh, through a calibrated lens. You can have multiple users in different situations getting uh, very close to the same results. Uh, the speed and convenience of, of the, uh, the whole uh, system down at your shoe tops or, or in, uh, uh, up, up to 18 feet, uh, easy to take measurements and, and capture skylines quickly, and then the data transfer to operate with other programs as well. 
I'll just mention, uh, in, in, for those of you doing PV applications, there are uh, uh, various models uh, for how to calculate PV production in AC kilowatts. That's the, really the key number. But it depends on a lot of things that are sort of weather related and position related and then uh, specification and design related. And so we have this tool called the Solmetric PV Designer, which allows you to pull the sun eye readings in. Those are these icons here where they were taken on the roof. We calculate where the shade is going to impact uh, the modules. We pull modules in from a database of modules and calculate overall production for up to four designs and do comparisons. So that's uh, software that is associated with the, the uh, SunEye, but uh, also sold separately. We do have a webinar on the PB Designer uh, tomorrow at uh, 10 o'clock uh, California time. So feel free to join us for that. And I will go ahead and if you have any uh, further questions, I will uh, stay on the line and answer them. If you're, uh, uh, if you've had enough, uh, feel free to uh, depart. And uh, thank you for joining. So I will go ahead and get questions now. Once again, thanks.